This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening, now I hear it. Um, welcome everybody to the second installment of um, Bugs and Drugs, and of course we're um, still sort of following up on um, what happens if our immune system needs a little um, help. And last week we saw that um, even though we may not have any condition like Elizabeth, all of our immune systems can use the help of drugs sometimes. And for those of you uh, who weren't here last week, my name is Marika Krudering. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacology here and have been involved with Mini Medical School for many years and it's my pleasure to keep um, enjoying your company and talking about these interesting things. So let's go um, back into where we were last week. Last week you were um, very engaged and asked very good questions talking about some of the drugs and how they work. And so last week you learned about um, the famous drugs, the penicillins, and how they interfere with the ability of bacteria to um, have a cell wall. And we saw a little video how if we add penicillin to bacteria, they exploded. So that drug works pretty well. Then we also talked about a different way of um, inhibiting the growth of bacteria by attacking their machinery that they use to make more proteins. So to make the little um, units they need to form bacteria. And so we're going to keep on marching through all the different ways we have to interfere with bacterial growth. And in fact, we're going to move up the chain tonight. We're also going to talk about interfering with growth of the eukaryotes, such as fungi. And then last but not least, we'll talk about the very exciting um, development of antiviral drugs, and in particular, the drugs we have to manage HIV. So quite a lot of um, drugs to talk about, so we'll touch mostly on the big picture items. And remembering from last week um, that you know when we think about drugs and how to make molecules that target the bacteria or the parasites or the virus and not us, we want to focus on the difference between what the bacteria has and what we have. And as we move up the evolutionary chain, we can see that becomes harder and harder. So um, where we're going to start tonight is by looking at um, a different way to interfere with growth of bacteria, and that is by interfering with the ability of the microorganism to synthesize DNA. And DNA, of course, is the core of our being. It's where we have all our genetic material, and uh, many of the um, building blocks are the same in bacteria and in us. And so when we think of um, bacterial DNA, one of the things um, that is similar both in humans and in bacteria is we have quite a lot of it. And so in order for um, our cells to be able to hold all the DNA inside, it's going to be packaged pretty tightly. And the bacterial DNA um, is uh, wound up and twisted and it forms a, what's called a supercoiled form and as you see here um, this is a plasmid or a piece of circular DNA that is relaxed it's like a rubber band and um, when the DNA is stored or when the bacteria tries to um, repair a little piece it gets stored into these double twists 
And there are two enzymes involved in putting the twists in, and that enzyme is called DNA gyrase. And then there's also an enzyme to take the twists out, and that is called topoisomerase. Now, the name of these enzymes um, do not matter so much tonight, but I hope you can appreciate the importance of these enzymes in the ability of a cell to store and manipulate DNA. And when we have stored our DNA, which are two, um, if you imagine, two strands with um, different building blocks, and they are wound around each other, so the red strand and the blue strand, and if you want to um, create a daughter cell, you need to copy your DNA and you may need to make an exact replica of your DNA to give your DNA to your offspring. This is essential in all life forms. And when you are making copies of DNA, this is done what's called semi-conservatively, where um, the original strand is kept open and then some enzymes will make exact copies of the original strand. And we're not getting into that in much detail now, but what you can see is in order for the enzyme to fit in there and start making an exact copy, this strain needs to be um, unwound, right? So we need this enzyme that allows us to unwind the twist in order to um, make more copies of the DNA. And so we have a cool video to sort of show you how those enzymes work. And again, the bottom line here is these enzymes are key for an organism to live and to procreate. And so you can already feel it coming. The target of our upcoming drug has probably something to do with these enzymes. And there you go. Let's consider what happens as DNA unwinds during replication. As DNA unwinds, it acts like this rope when we pull apart its two strands. As you pull the strands apart, twisting tension builds up in the rest of the coiled portion. It is actually adding one twist to the remaining rope for each twist pulled out of it. At some point, you can't separate the strands anymore. The remaining rope is too tightly twisted. If you relax your tension on the rope, it will twist around itself in a supercoil it is releasing tension. If you want to keep pulling the rope apart, you have to release the tension periodically. And one way to do this is to cut the rope and splice it back together. This problem has been best characterized in small circular DNAs. There are two methods of dealing with this problem in DNA. One cuts only one strand of the DNA double helix and the other cuts both strands. Let's look at the first. Topoisomerase 1 enzymes cut a single strand of the double helix, pass the other strand through the cut, and reseal the break, relaxing the overwound molecule, which now has one fewer twist. Topoisomerase 2 enzymes do the same thing, but with both strands of the double helix. Topoisomerase 2 cuts both strands of a double-stranded DNA and passes another double strand through the break and then reseals the break. So if a molecule of DNA is supercoiled, topoisomerase 2 can remove the supercoiling, two twists at a time, to yield a relaxed circle. Pretty cool, huh? So um, this is indeed what happens in bacteria. And so you can imagine this was a great target to go after um, with drugs, because if we inhibit the ability of the bacteria to manipulate its DNA, it would not be able to make more of itself. And so the drugs that were developed specifically to inhibit these enzymes are called the fluoroquinolones. And you may have heard of this drug. We talked a little bit about it last week. Um, the prototype would be ciprofloxacin. So these drugs inhibit the ability of the bacteria to manipulate DNA, and um, both topoisomerase 2 and 4 are inhibited by these drugs. Because these drugs are targeting this key enzyme, you know, in the manipulation of DNA, you can imagine they cover a very, very wide range of bacteria, not just staph or not just strep, but many, many, many forms. And so 
there were um, originally the use was really widespread. So it can be used for urinary tract infections, often abbreviated as UTI, serious bone infections, pneumonias, and um, skin infections. So a wide range of organisms would all be sensitive to these drugs, including the organism anthrax, again that came up last week. And we'll see in a second that the whole anthrax scare um, did this drug group a lot of harm, um, but we'll get to that in the next slide. Similarly to what we saw um, last time, drugs are very effective at um, inhibiting bacterial growth, but there are some side effects and some are pretty unique. When these drugs were uh, first on the market, um, a very serious but sort of rare effect happened that it seemed to interfere with the ability of um, formation and maintenance of tendon, so the tendinous sheath around the muscles. So some folks would um, get uh, ruptures in their tendons and it was really associated with the use of these drugs. And so um, it sort of illustrates that as we are targeting enzymes that are sort of uh, attacking processes that happen both in men and in bacteria, you get more and more risk of maybe um, seeing processes happening in the host. So uh, GI upset, remember last time we talked about anytime you use an antimicrobial drug, you can kill off some of the normal gut flora and the remaining guys can outgrow and you can have pretty upset GI system dizziness in some of the cases, and photosensitivity, and arth arthralgia means pain in the joints. So it's sort of a musculoskeletal um, side effect spectrum that came with these drugs. But very well tolerated in general, and very, very useful in the clinical setting because it really covered, as we like to call it, so many different organisms. But then what happened after these drugs were on the market? Then the um, anthrax scare happened. There was one uh, outbreak, a single person in Florida. And then there was the incident of somebody mailing white powder to um, organizations or individuals they like to threat. And so this created a huge scare and everybody started buying ciprofloxacin from the website, from in Canada, who knows. Um, and so there was a lot of non-useful um, use of ciprofloxacin. People were saying, oh, um, I drove by this site where the FBI was doing this investigation, I better take two tablets and everything will be fine. And what turned out is because this drug was really intended for use against respiratory tract infections, urinary tract infections, bone infections, not just anthrax, people would take ciprofloxacin two days, way too short a time period to effectively eradicate anything that, that would need to be eradicated. Um, the, some of the organisms, especially strep pneumo, the one that lives in the throat and can give um, rise to strep throat if it outgrows all the other bacteria, that particular one became resistant to ciprofloxacin very, very rapidly. And so within um, the matter of half a year, I believe, um, some of the communities could no longer use this drug for um, indications such as strep, strep throat or some pneumonia because people had just been using this willy-nilly and really generated um, a resistant strain of um, strep pneumo. So again, if you don't f use it appropriately, you really do a disservice to other people in the community. Very interesting um, history behind all that, but we're just focused on the drugs for now. So that's your first class of drugs. Now you know that the fluoroquinolones inhibit this DNA winding and unwinding enzyme and are very, very effective um, for those organisms that are still sensitive to the drug. So we're going to stick to the theme of interfering with the metabolism of DNA in our microorganisms. 
And whereas the fluoroquinolones were relatively new drugs, we're going to talk about a very, very, very old drug or combination of drugs next. And so we're going to interfere with the function of folic acid. And folic acid, you, you hear that it's important, we need it. And the reason why we need folic acid is folic acid is essential both for um, us humans and many microbes to synthesize DNA. And we're going to look in a little bit of more detail at DNA. And again, we see here a nice colorful diagram. And DNA has building blocks. And part of those building blocks are sugars, bases, and phosphates. And the bases are the com compounds that give the DNA uh, molecules their letters. So there's a C and a G, an A and a T. And um, the T is the building block that we're going to focus on now. And so in order to make DNA and replicate DNA and make more DNA to give to your offspring, you need to be able to synthesize each of these four bases. And so the drugs that we're gonna talk about next are going to inhibit the ability of the microorganism to make a T. So far, so good. Cup of tea, there we go. So now, let's keep our eye on the prize. We are, all we care about is this T. And if we work backwards, we see this is the base we need to make. The thing we make it off, or the precursor, is um, uridine monophosphate, UMP. Again, the name is not important. This is the thing that is going to become the base T in DNA. In order for this U to turn into this T, we need to add one methyl group, which is a carbon and three hydrogen, this CH3, this red thing. If we add this red thing to the U, we get our T and we have functional DNA. Now, this molecule, the methyl group, can only be added if somebody hands it over and helps stick this molecule onto the U. And the thing that acts as a helper and helps stick that methyl group onto the U is tetrahydrofolate. So here's our folate. And the role of this folate really is a carrier and sort of the, the actual thing that sticks it on. It facilitates addition of this methyl group onto the T in DNA. And you can see that um, this folate comes here in the form of tetrahydrofolate. It just means tetra for hydro. It has four hydrogen groups. Um, it becomes tetrahydrofolate after it's being reduced by an enzyme because when you eat folate, it tends to be in the form of dihydrofolate. So bottom line is we need folate because folate is the only thing that can grab a methyl group and stick it onto the U so we have a T that we can put in our DNA. So far, so good? Where does the methyl group, where does it get the methyl um, it, the methyl group, there's a special pool of precursors that, uh, let's say, are, are hanging around when you're um, making DNA. So we now know what we need to make the T. And so the drugs we have are going to interfere with our ability to turn the folate that we eat that is not useful, that is not yet capable of sticking a methyl group on into the tetrahydrofolate form, which is the only form that is capable of sticking on this methyl group. And so the drug is called trimethoprim and it's abbreviated as TMP. Now up here you see an enzyme that is, that is, the name has synthase, so it indicates that this is involved in synthesis of something or making it from scratch. And bacteria and parasites are capable of making folic acid, whereas we 
um, have to eat it. We cannot make it. And so that's why uh, women, when they're um, pregnant, they have to eat folic acid because they have to make enough DNA for themselves and the baby because we cannot synthesize it. So it's an essential nutrient. If you don't have it, you can't make your DNA. Now, bacteria are a little more self-sufficient, um, and they can actually make it. But now that we know that, that's a wonderful target. That's something they have and we don't have. So we are going to attack that with a drug as well. And the drugs we have for that are sulfonamide or sulfur-containing drugs that are very effective at inhibiting the organism's ability to make folate. So we have two drugs here. And of course, in bacteria, if we give the sulfonamide, so the sulfur drug, and this guy together, we're going to hit this pathway uh, with two banks. We're going to give this bacteria two hits over the head so it really can't make any T's, no DNA. So again, just to reiterate, we don't have that synthase. We have to eat it but the bacteria do, so that's a wonderful target. We hit them, but we don't hit us. However, we do have that enzyme that makes dihydrofolate into tetrahydrofolate, and so um, the drug developer, and in this case, it was a very smart woman who later on got the Nobel Prize for medicine for her work on this pathway, um, made the molecule so that in, inhibits the form in bacteria a thousandfold more than the form in us, the human form. So it, it involved some clever chemistry, but this is just um, an inspirational picture. The woman, she is called Gertrude Elion, and she got the Nobel Prize for this work and work she did subsequently um, in 1988. So all you high school students um, don't hold back. Women can will no win Nobel Prizes. So I expect nothing less from you guys. So when are these antifolates used? Well, again, we're, co we're targeting a process that is so essential to life, making DNA. Um, it may not be a surprise that it will work in bacteria. It will work, in fact, very well in parasites. And to some extent, it works a little bit in us as well. So parasites here, I listed green. So these two names are parasites, not bacteria. And the bacteria that are often treated with these um, drugs, the antifolate drugs, are um, urinary tract infections caused by E. coli, for example. Um, otitis media, ear infections, very common in young kids and many of the respiratory tract infections can be sensitive to this drug combination. So many of us may have in fact experienced these drugs or the drug combination. The parasites that are um, sensitive to these organisms um, are interesting. So Pneumocystis carinii is an organism that likes to go to the lungs and give um, severe pneumonia if the patient's immune system is not capable of fighting off the organism. Now many of us, roughly 70% of the population, has this organism. Many of us are not sick because our immune system is constantly keeping the organism at bay. Patients who suffer from these infections are patients who are immunocompromised. So for instance, patients who are HIV uh, infected with HIV, the virus has taken out their immune system and now they can't fight off these organisms anymore. And in fact, pneumocystis carinii is uh, one of the main reasons when patients die um, when they are infected with HIV in the old days. It, it was the super infections that ended up uh, unfortunately killing them. So this really sort of this knowledge then um, revamped the use of these antifolate drugs and we use them to keep the number of pneumocystis organisms in immunocompromised patients very low. 
Similarly, if you are um, undergoing cancer chemotherapy, your immune system is very depressed. You're very um, at risk for getting these opportunistic infections. And sometimes these drugs have to be used to sort of keep you from getting those infections on top of um, your other suffering that you are doing already. So pneumocystis causes pneumonia. Um, many of us have it, but only if you're immunocompromised, you're going to suffer pneumonia. Toxoplasma is another interesting parasite. Many of us carry it. Many of us are not sick. But um, you may remember there's a tale going around when um, a woman is pregnant, she should not be with cats or handle cat litter. And so that is not just because um, pregnant women are lazy and they don't want to clean the cat litter box. It is, in fact, um, true that um, Toxoplasma likes to live in cats as well, will come out in cat litter. And if um, a person is pregnant and would become infected for the first time, the organism can go cross the placenta, move into the fetus, and cause um, severe problems um, all the way up to um, developmental problems. So really reason enough not to try and expose somebody to that. So cat litter and pregnancy definitely don't go together. If you're not pregnant and you were um, infected with toxoplasma, this drug combination that hits the folate, prevents the organism from making a T, is very effective at um, curing your infection. Very useful drugs, even though they're very, very old. They've been around since the um, 30s slash 50s. So very, very old, very efficacious. Adverse drug reaction. So most often when you, if you might receive this drug, it will be a combination of both trimethoprim and the sulfate. And the adverse drug reactions tend to be more related to the sulfa component in the drug. Many people are allergic to the sulfur moiety that we can see in many of the drugs. Again, now you're pros at predicting that antimicrobial drugs can give us GI disturbances, so that's no surprise. And then photosensitivity. We saw this last week, too. And I have a picture for you just to illustrate. So this um, patient uh, was on this combination of drugs, was feeling fine, but then as soon as she uh, walked out in the sun just across the street for 15 minutes, immediately the parts that were sun exposed became very, very red and very itchy and sort of the, the rash was really elevated. So when you're taking these drugs, you should try and avoid the sun and put on a lot of sunscreen. Um, it's, it reacts to the sunlight and gives you this very strong allergic reaction. Question, why you're sensitive to the sun? Um, so my understanding is, is that a little bit of the drug um, gets changed by the sunlight and forms this very um, allergenic compound. So if the drug's not broken down, you're fine. Um, but that may not be the full story. I'm not an expert, but we definitely see this. And, and it can be avoided by not going into the but sun. The is an allergic reaction the sun is. Correct. It's a true allergic reaction. All right. <coughs> So, boom, your guys are going fast. You still now have a second way of interfering with DNA synthesis. Now you've moved up not only bacteria, but you also now know how to knock out some parasites. And parasites that are really, really life-threatening in those individuals that are immunocompromised. So last week, we promised that we should, you know, we're going to cover the whole spectrum of all the possible invaders. So we're going to briefly touch on a few antifungal agents, but again, keeping it big picture just so you sort of get the general idea. I saw, um, sorry, I saw, um, I mentioned last week that there's many, many, many antimicrobial drugs because we can find many targets that are unique to uh, bacteria that we don't have because bacteria are prokaryotes and we are eukaryotes. 
Fungi are also eukaryotes, so it was much harder to find targets that are so different in uh, a fungus from the targets in us. Also, um, there wasn't a huge market before we had this large population of immunocompromised patients, meaning patients infected with HIV, and now we have so many um, patients who are undergoing cancer chemotherapy that they um, spend some time um, during that therapy being very immunocompromised in need of um, protection by these drugs. Question. So, very good question. So, are number one and number five talking about the same thing? And the answer is no. Um, the number one is talking about bacteria, and bacteria have a cell membrane, and then around that they have a cell wall. So, bacteria have this double layer to really protect them from the outside world, and it is different components. In number five, we're really talking about the cell membrane, which is in bacteria sort of the, the, most, the innermost layer. So in number one, we're talking about the outside jacket of the bacteria. In number five, we're talking about the only jacket that this eukaryotic organism has, which is very similar to our plasma membrane. Are they primarily lipids? In five, primarily lipids, absolutely. So Great question, because I can talk about that next. I'll have one question, and then we'll go. So the question is, it's wonderful that we have so many uh, bacteria, but there are bacteria that are resistant to many, many of these organisms. What do we do? So we talked a little bit about that last week, where we had the vancomycin-resistant staph or the vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. And um, for those uh, organisms, we actually have backup drugs that are covering those vancomycin-resistant organisms. In the news, there are um, uh, reports of, about tuberculosis that is resistant to many of the organisms. And what we're currently doing is in part going back to really old drugs that we have abandoned because they cause so much toxicity in the person. But um, we're trying everything combinations, super high concentrations, or um, going back to the older drugs, which in some cases work. So for most of the um, current multi-drug resistance, we still have one step, um, the next step. But then after that, not always. One more question, and then we'll move on to the fungals. Yes? So when there is resistance, do the bacteria have always the same way to become resistant? And the answer is um, yes and no. So the big picture is if your drug targets a certain enzyme, one way the bacteria might become resistant is change that enzyme so that it can still do its function, but you, the drug can no longer bind. But there are multiple ways, um, and whatever can randomly confer resistance will occur. All right, so back to antifungal agents. And um, fung antifungal agents make use of the fact that one of the main differences between a fungus and us, even though we like to think we're very different, uh, we're actually very similar. But the thing we can target is the kind of lipid that these organisms have in their cell membrane. And so here we have a diagram of a giant single fungal cell. And this is a lipid bilayer. So very fatty molecules. And they have, um, we, anyway, that's besides the point here. And the main lipid in the membrane of a fungus is ergosterol. It sounds a lot like cholesterol, but it's different enough that we can use that as a target for drugs while it leaves alone the cholesterol which we have in our membranes. So we always hear tonight's a good night because you always hear cholesterol's bad, high cholesterol's bad, high cholesterol's bad, good cholesterol is good because all of our cells, the wall is made up for a large part of cholesterol and if you don't have cholesterol, you can't make cell membranes. So we do need cholesterol, we just don't need too much of it. So we have cholesterol, 
the fungus has ergosterol. So, okay, we have a target, let's hit it. So the most severe antifungal drug is amphotericin. When you infuse this into um, a patient who has a fungal infection, it will bind to the fungus, it will push aside the lipids, it will just physically poke a hole in the fungus and the fungus, its insides will leak out and it's dead. Very, very efficacious, very powerful drug. The problem with it is that when you infuse it in a patient, the patient feels terrible. So they uh, flush, they feel like they have the flu, they have a headache, they get the shakes, sometimes they get seizures. The patients who have to undergo treatments with this drug call it amphoterrible. Like, oh doctor, I don't want it. But if you have the choice between severe fungal infection, which can also spread to your nervous system and um, eventually cause meningitis and uh, will be your end if untreated, of course you take this drug over um, a fungal infection, but very unpleasant. Nystatin um, is exactly the same, but this one is so toxic that in fact we don't infuse it in patients because the patient would feel terrible and they would be in terrible shape. But it is so effective, it will definitely poke holes in the fungal cell wall, so we can use it as a cream on the outside. As long as you don't get it in you, we're good to go. So you will see Nystatin if you go to the pharmacy and look in the antifungal creams that you can buy over the counter, you can see this drug. Just make sure that nobody gets their hands on it and accidentally starts chomping it down because they would feel very, very sick. But it's exactly the same as amphotericin, but so toxic that we don't infuse it. So all the antifungal drugs that we have were not very creative. In the end, all the drugs target this ergosterol. We really don't have any other targets in the fungal life cycle that we can really make use of. But um, what we do have is different ways of getting there. So we started on the outside saying our target or gostrol, let's just clung on to it and poke a hole. Pretty good. We, of course, we know that there are steps involved in the synthesis of making this ergosterol before it gets put into the cell membrane. And we have different drugs that target specific steps in the synthesis of eventually ergosterol. So amphotericin we talked about. Um, there's a drug that interferes with the fungal ability to, again, manipulate DNA. It has a name, griseofulvin. It's less um, specifically targeted um, towards ergosterol, but it turns out that the end result is limited amount of ergosterol. But if we see here, these are names of chemical structures that are the building blocks that eventually will become ergosterol. And we have drugs that interfere with the conversion of step one into step two. And just to show you uh, some drugs, again, that you may um, have encountered in your personal life, terbinafine is a drug that um, binds specifically to areas where there's a lot of keratin. So those of you who may have had trouble with fungal toenails, and we have a fun picture to show in a second, so heads up, pre-warning, um, will be very susceptible to oral use of this drug. And so you have to get um, the drug into the bloodstream because the fungus um, can live everywhere and reaching it uh, from the inside out is going to be more effective. Secondly, we have a large class of drugs that is very efficacious, again, at in inhibiting the last step, so really making of our gosterol. And these are what I call the azoles. And again, if you go to uh, the pharmacy and you look at what you can buy over the counter, you can see meconazole or itraconazole, all sorts of creams that you can put all sorts of places where you may have fungal infections and um, very, very efficacious. 
But these drugs are not limited to over-the-counter use, stuff you can buy yourself. Um, some of these, for instance, itraconazole, can be used again in the hospital in-house when patients have severe meningitis caused by fungal infections. So very efficacious drugs. Bottom line is really ergosterol is the only thing we can go after because fungi are eukaryotes, so are we. If we um, go after other targets, they're too similar. So let's do a little quiz. I hope you, uh, your dinner's far down enough. So we said, because um, no medical lecture is complete without some gross pictures. So we're going to have another one after this. So we have a 52-year-old man, persistent toenail infection that had not improved with topical azole treatment. Oral therapy was initiated with terbinafine, very good, or terbinafine, very good. Okay, score. Next, even better. So this is a oral cavity or somebody's mouth is open. This is the tongue. These are the lips. This person has um, infection with um, candida, oral thrush. This will respond very well to um, the conazoles. So fluconazole, itraconazole, clotrimazole, or again, this very toxic or powerful nystatin treatment. But again, we said you don't want to get the nystatin inside your circulation, so you would have to swash slush and swirl, and then spit it out. Very, very efficacious, and this will resolve very quickly. All right, so everybody's still alive? So now we've covered bacteria, parasites, fungal, antifungal drugs. Let's go back to sort of thinking about DNA and um, in more detail, talk about the drugs that we have to manage or suppress viral infections. And again, you know, we already said we have so many drugs against microbes, that's great, bacteria. We have far fewer drugs to treat fungal infections because they're so similar to us. And then before the development of many of the drugs for HIV, we had even fewer antiviral drugs because the virus is so clever that it infects us, and we'll see a little video, and then makes our machinery, so our DNA, our ribosomes, our topoisomerases, we're doing all the work to make more virus, and then the virus is saying, okay, see you later, and goes back out of the cell and steals a little bit of our cell membrane, even, and um, then has made more viruses. So the virus uses our machinery, so anytime we would inhibit that machinery, we would also inhibit our own machinery, our own ability to make DNA and make proteins. And that has been a real struggle. But as we will see, there's going to be hope. So let's look initially at a video of sort of the viral life cycle so we can look for um, challenges and targets for drugs. And I'll show you a video first, and then we'll go slowly through actual um, still images. Uh, here's the virus particle with its envelope and proteins and genome. And you're going to see this represented as being within a pipette that's going to be dropped onto a petri dish uh, containing uh, human cells that are going to be susceptible to infection. Here's a blow up of a single cell. Keep your eye here. These are the cell surface receptors. Here comes the virus part that's going to bind. Here comes the disassembly stage. The genomes will, in this case, enter the nucleus. Not all viruses have to do that. And now you see replication. Here comes the assembly reaction. And these cells are now, the capsids are going to now go to the cell surface and bud. So what we've just witnessed is a single cycle of viral infection. A single particle infects a single cell and gives rise to many 
progeny. On average, 100 or so progeny per cell. The person you just saw is uh, Dr. Ganem, used to be a researcher here, uh, now moved on, and the video you saw were from the HHMI website of um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, um, an NIH institute that has wonderful videos, so if you want to know anything about anything and know that it's true and accurately researched, that would be a wonderful place to go to. And so um, he's the expert on viral infection, so to do justice where justice do, um, I show his video. But so let's look slowly, in case it went by a little fast. The virus will infect a human cell. First it has to attach. Then once it's inside, it will make use of our particular um, lysosomal structures to unpack its DNA or RNA, as we'll see in a second. Then um, if it has its uh, genomic material in the form of RNA, it makes it into DNA first. So that's step three. The red thing is RNA. Then it makes it into um, DNA, step three. Then it takes its DNA and starts inserting it into our own DNA. So just sort of cozies up and says, okay, I'm going to sit here. And then next time when the host is making more DNA or reading this DNA to make protein, we're inadvertently making all the stuff the virus wants us to make. So very, very clever, very nifty in that way. Then we have these proteins. And some of the proteins need to be clipped to fit exactly um, their function. And um, so these proteins that are here made as sort of precursors, sort of coming out of the factory, then need to be clipped apart to be become the final product. And then you have the assembly stage, stage seven, then it sort of pushes through the membrane, steals a big part of our lipids from the membrane, and now we have many, many, many more viruses. So you can appreciate, because all this work is done by us, it's really hard to find something that is unique for the virus. And so viruses can cause mild diseases, ranging from, of course, very, very severe diseases. And there's many different forms of viruses. And again, we're sort of painting um, a big picture here. Um, and we'll, we'll come to sort of explaining this in a second. So a virus can cause the flu, which can be mild. But um, the human Im um, immunodeficiency virus has caused AIDS, and of course, that's not mild at all, even though we have made quite a lot of progress in developing drugs specifically for this condition that we now um, can make it a manageable condition, whereas not that long ago, it was a very direct death sentence if you were uh, infected with this organism. I'm going to only very briefly talk about drugs we have to um, interfere with the viruses that cause the flu because the most effective way we can help the community from preventing um, getting the flu is getting vaccinated. So we want to prevent being infected and becoming sick in the first place as opposed to waiting till we have the flu and then taking medications. Um, Having said that, we have drugs that target the viruses that cause the flu, and we can see those used, again, in patients that are immunocompromised. We, they need these medications because their ability to respond to um, vaccination may be compromised, or um, um, in, in elderly patients, who may, um, in whom the flu may be more severe and they may suffer more consequences. So when we're looking at drugs that we have that can interfere with the flu virus, we have sort of two classes. The first class um, in, includes amantidine and rimantidine, and you can see the names are pretty similar. And these drugs interfere with the ability of the virus to unpack its 
uh, genetic material, so sort of step two, so it fuses, comes in, and then, okay, take my coat off so I can shove my DNA somewhere where somebody else can replicate it for me. And so um, these two drugs interfere with that very early step. Um, the resistance to these drugs develops very rapidly, so, so we don't really um, use it that widespread at the moment. So sort of, but just so you know, so we have drugs against the flu. One of them interferes with this unpacking reaction right as the virus comes in. The second class of drugs um, is zanamivir and oseltamivir. So um, you can recognize the word virus in here. So it must be a drug that inhibits something like a virus. Very clever. And what these drugs do is they inhibit pretty much the last step in the viral life cycle. We saw that um, as the virus is um, ready to leave the cell, it goes through the cell membrane of the host, and then it picks up a couple of uh, pieces of membrane. It sort of rolls around in our membrane and picks up the whole membrane. But you also saw that in the video, when the virus comes to a cell and it's trying to infect it, it was binding to those receptors that were sitting on the cell surface. So the, the virus is coming and it's sort of like, okay, my landing gear, I'm landing on the landing dock. So there's stuff on our cells that is very sticky for a virus specifically to glom onto. So when you are a virus and now you're trying to exit, you kind of don't want those sticky things because then all the viruses are going to stick to each other because they have these big landing docks that attract the virus. So the virus has a very clever way of picking up our membrane and then clipping off those parts in the membrane that are designed or are there that stick to the virus. So it selectively clips out the things that make it stick and then the virus can butt off and leave. So it's, okay, give me your membrane. I'm getting rid of the sticky stuff. See you later. And so the enzyme that um, clips off these receptors is neuraminidase. And um, these drugs then inhibit the ability of the virus to sort of clip off those um, sticky receptors and it really limits the ability of the virus now to leave the cell and infect more neighboring cells. Um, this particular one is um, widely used. We use it here in the hospital. Uh, the brand name is Tamiflu, but people get pretty upset stomachs, so the patients call it tummy flu. <laughs> the ones on the bottom prevent the exit, so once you have the virus, you limit sort of infection of one cell to the neighbor cell. But, but you still uh, use it once you have the virus. Uh, a 20-year-old is naturally more resistant to somebody who's 60-year-old. Because we have our wonderful immune system, that's not necessarily true because there's different kind of flu viruses. And if you are 60 years old, you were around when that particular kind of flu um, was around, so you have antibodies against that flu. And in fact, not that long ago, when sort of the swine flu and the avian flu came around, remember, it was only high school students. It was young people who were getting affected, and the old people, old people, no offense, but people who were around, I'll include myself, people who were around when that previous strain was there actually have antibodies. And so, um, so that's part one, so if you were around, when you had time to build up immunity, um, you are actually better off. So, so that's part one. And part two, um, if you are um, mounting this immune response, your immune system will come up and kill these guys before they ever have the chance to become, you know, one becomes 100, 100 becomes 10,000, 10,000 becomes a million. So your immune system will kill them before any of the diagram ever happens. All right, so that's, we could talk six hours about the flu, but, but I really wanted to sort of show off some of the progress in antiretroviral therapy, because really um, this is where all the 
uh, latest changes ha have been happening and it really has made a huge impact on the lives of the individuals who, who have been unfortunate to contract this pure viral infection. And so the antiviral agents that we um, are using nowadays in a combination are um, referred to as HART, which means highly active antiretroviral therapy. So that's a lot of words, but highly active makes sense. NT makes sense. And retroviral refers to the type of virus that we're going to attack. And so the virus that we'll talk about is human immunodeficiency virus. Um, it used to be something else, named something else before, but now it's called human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. And if you are an individual that is infected with HIV, you can then develop the um, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. So the virus is called HIV. And if you are a person who's unfortunate enough to be infected, now all your T cells are infected, so the arm of your immune system that is involved in fighting off all sorts of invaders is now compromised and in fact completely eliminated, and now you, you have acquired the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. It's a pure viral infection, just like the flu, except very dramatic. So in order to um, limit the consequences of this viral infection, we need many, many, many drugs at the same time, at least three or four. And in the old days, this meant that the patient had to take a bucket full of pills on the hour, every hour, wake up at two in the night. It was pretty horrendous just to try and take the pills. Big, big, big differences. We know a lot more now. So let's sort of Thinking about managing this infection in patients, um, what we're trying to do in patients at the moment is maximum and durable suppression of viral load. So it, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is, is that we can manage it pretty well. The bad news is that the drugs we currently have are not curing the patient. The, the, the virus, the DNA is in the patient's DNA and, and we're preventing the virus from making more, but we're not yet fully curing the patient. Given that the, vi the virus specifically in goes into these T cells, remember the arm of the immune system that is um, helping and recognizing invaders and presenting them to the antibodies, this really complex series of cells, um, automatically um, when the virus is in those cells, the person has lost this part of the immune system. And what we want to do in patients is restore their um, immune response, have enough uh, T cells so they can prevent themselves from being invaded all the time. Um, reduction of sort of uh, morbidity and mortality, so prevent these infections from happening, preventing uh, death from happening as a consequence of these infections. And then um, this is a hopeful one. Um, in the past, it was sort of a short time span that, that uh, these folks were looking at. But now we have the sort of um, new outlook that these therapies are going to be long term. So now we want to worry about what is the side effect of a drug over a long period of time and how can we make that better for the patient. So very different outlook now than, you know, even five, six years ago. So let's go back then to our viral infection and look at what HIV virus does. So we have here now a human T cell. And again, in the first lecture, we talked about all these different T cells that are involved in many of the functions of protecting us from invaders. So there's T helper cells, there's killer cells, there's presenting cells, all these nifty things, all orchestrated by these T cells. And we um, have a lot of names for all these different cells, and that's how we know which T cell it is. 
and um, the cell that is most likely to be infected by HIV is called CD4 positive. It just means we have all sorts of dyes or different uh, markers, if you will, and um, if we mark um, a T cell and it has this mark CD4, we call it a CD4 positive cell. So it's just one of the subtypes of T cells that is most uh, susceptible to infection. So here comes the virus. It um, enters the cell, takes off its coat, and now we have RNA. And RNA is, um, in all of us, not the main carrier of genetic information. So the way we store our genetic information is DNA, and DNA is this double-stranded helix, just like bacteria. We store it in this double-stranded loop. So for the virus to trick us into making all the proteins for the virus, it needs to make its RNA into DNA. And this step, making RNA into DNA, is backwards. We don't do that. We only have DNA, then we make it into RNA, and then we make it into protein. So now all of you clever students say, hey, if we're going from RNA to DNA, that's backwards. We don't do that. That's a target. That's only happening in the virus, and that's not happening in humans. So that's something we can go after and then hope that we're going to hit the virus and not the human machinery. Going backwards from RNA to DNA also is included in the name. It says retrovirus. Retro is, it's, you know, cool on hate street, but it also means you're going backwards. You're going from RNA to DNA the wrong way. So a virus that is a retrovirus has RNA as its genetic material and then needs to make it into DNA. So no surprise, the first class of drugs that finally um, arrived to help us do something of slowing down the HIV infection is a drug that inhibits the enzyme, which is called reverse transcriptase. We keep blaming the virus. You're going backwards, reverse transcriptase. Big target made a huge difference. Again, Nobel Prize, so getting you warmed up. So we are going to see the drugs that were the first drugs included in the regimen to manage HIV were reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Secondly, we see here that after the virus asks us to make all these proteins for it, it also asks us to make this protease enzyme that is an a, a little pair of scissors that clips these proteins into the right uh, fragments so that it can make new virus particles. This protease, again, is something very unique to the virus. So even though we make it for the virus, we don't have it. So if we inhibit this guy here, again, we can target the virus, but not us for the most part. And so these two drugs really were the beginning of the cornerstone of therapy of using many, many combinations, so at least probably two drugs in this class and one drug of the protease inhibitors to stop uh, at least the virus from uh, infecting and killing more of the T cells. So let's look um, in a little bit more details what we, um, what's happening here. So when we're talking, uh, yes, question. Is this is going on inside the T cell. This is going on inside the T cell, yep, of the unfortunate individual. All right, so now, in order to sort of go back to uh, looking at how um, the first class of drugs work, we're back to DNA. And um, remember, we are now sort of looking at an enzyme that is the viral enzyme that is taking RNA and making that into DNA. And we've seen before that DNA is this interesting a sugar and a base and some phosphates, and there's an A and a T and a C and a G. And you guys now all know how to make a T. 
and when we are interfering with the ability of a virus to make this DNA, what we are giving is we are giving something that almost looks like a T, but not quite. And so these drugs are really fooling the virus into thinking, oh, I have a T. I can add this into my string of pearls that is going to make my nice long DNA chain, except there's something wrong with this T. It's a drug. And once this drug is built in, the DNA is stuck and the enzyme can no longer add the next set of pearls to really make this long chain. So the virus cannot make DNA, the virus is stuck. And so it can't make DNA, it can't integrate, it can't really um, propagate in the T cell. So it looks like a T, but it's quite different and the enzyme is stuck. And so um, you may or may not have seen these drugs um, have many names, all for the same drug, but one of the names for these drugs is a three-letter word or a three-letter code abbreviation, and the letter in that three-letter word is often the base it refers to. So we have fake out T's, which is um, AZT. You may have heard of AZT. So we're faking the DNA to put in a T, but it's a fake T and now it's stuck. There is um, DDI or um, drugs that look just like a C, DDC. So we have a fake bases for all of these. So we can combine um, different cocktails to really inhibit the ability of the virus to make DNA. And this is on purpose overwhelming don't pay attention to it, but the point here is that the virus is so clever and a big problem that we run into is that when you um, give these drugs, the virus is very busy trying to become resistant to these drugs. And uh, when we're treating patients with HIV, what's happening is we take samples of their blood, the blood, then uh, we look at the virus inside and we monitor the resistance of the virus to that particular drug. And um, it's not a matter of if the virus will become resistant, it's a matter of when. And so this can be 10 years, 15 years, but it is very important that um, the patient is always um, having blood levels of these drugs that are high enough so we constantly really hit the virus hard because again, if you expose the virus to suboptimal levels for a prolonged period of time, you really allow resistance to develop. So it's quite an involved process. And here you just see drug names, so AZT, DDI, DDC, D4T, 3TC. Um, so you recognize, right, this 3TC is going to be a fake C. DDT is a fake T. And so all these drugs are acting exactly the same, but if you start a patient on, let's say, DDI, and the enzyme will become resistant, you might still be able to switch to, let's say, 3TC, a different one going for the next base. And um, again, just sort of on purpose overwhelming, but just to show how much progress we have made scientifically to really figure this out and understand this and have quite a lot of drugs that we can at least mix and match um, to keep the viral load down. Of course, these drugs are not without toxicity. As we're talking about interfering with DNA and ability of DNA to make more or ability of the enzyme to make more DNA, we do see um, a syndrome that is called lactic acidosis, not in everybody, but in the early stages of uh, drug development. Um, this is a situation where it's sort of like, you know when you have sore muscles, there's a lot of lactic acid. If you sort of exponentially um, uh, increase that, that your whole body is sort of so acidic that pretty much everything goes wrong, that would be, um, a simple way of saying it. Um, and um, in the beginning, some patients, uh, there were some cases of fatal lactic acidosis. Um, again, now we have much better ways of recognizing it. 
and um, the, the newer drugs are much less likely to induce this, but in the early stages, we some of the drugs were targeting the human DNA synthesis too much, and then we would have these consequences. The newer drugs are, uh, I'll, uh, I'll get you in a second, the newer drugs are more selective for the viral um, form, and so less effect on humans. Question. The question or I guess uh, suggestion or observation is that um, this gentleman is pointing out that mitochondria are um, sort of captured bacteria, so way back um, in evolution, mitochondrial DNA um, entered us and we've kept that um, in our current cells. And so given that, it may not be surprising that what we see is this lactic acidosis is caused by inhibiting this bacterial slash, you know, it has changed over the years, form of DNA, and that's why we see it here. Possible. Yes. Uh, the question is, how do you determine um, what mutations the virus has, and has this uh, hastened genomic research? I think this is more, uh, it's the other way around. I think genomic research was already ongoing, and this allowed us to monitor the uh, mutations. Either way, it's good that we have it. So hugely important, um, if you don't mind, um, I'll, I'll move on and then I'll get your question in a second. Because I do want to talk um, about the second class of drugs. So we, so we have our fake building blocks, our fake T's, our fake A's, and we really hit the virus there. And then the second class of drugs are the drugs that interfere with the protease. And again, Many of you may have heard about these, the protease inhibitors. They were in the news, um, especially when they came out initially. Big break breakthrough because, again, now we had a target that would inhibit the virus and not touch a function in our own cells. Um, many of the names of these drugs, you may recognize, they end in vir. Again, we're trying to do something to the virus. And in this case, in particular, the HIV um, proteases. In trying to hit the virus really hard, what we have then is a combination of either two of these guys, so let's say a fake A and a fake T, and then add on a protease inhibitor, and that could consist, um, make up this highly active um, antiretroviral therapy. And now patients were, we could sort of suppress the virus very good. Patients could have um, quite a lot of, you could see the uh, number of CD4 positive T cells come back up. They would not constantly be sick. They would not constantly need antibiotics. So that was good. But then, now that we saw um, patients doing better for longer periods of time, with these particular drugs, we saw side effects that were becoming not life-threatening, but uncomfortable and sort of life-threatening in the long run. So what was interesting with these drugs, we saw, okay, now we're sort of, we dealt with the problem of HIV, but now these drugs are giving the patients um, hyperlipidemia. In other words, now we're giving them high cholesterol. That's not good. Also, insulin resistant. So these drugs now give these patients sort of diabetes or pre-diabetes. Again, not good. So we're sort of, we have one problem somewhat solved, but now we have another long-term problem that of course um, is less acutely life-threatening, but we don't really want to give our patients high cholesterol and diabetes. On top of that, um, due to the interference with the lipid metabolism, what you can see is a uh, redistribution. So you may have seen individuals without knowing their face is really skinny because all the fat that is um, on, the, on the face, in the skin, will disappear. It will all disappear from the arms and the legs and it will all deposit, um, let's say you can get sort of a buffalo hump or um, um, a quite a belly, and so these, these patients, it's, it's not because they're not exercising or because they're not eating right. The drug really um, gives them what they refer to as the protease pouch. The drugs really put all the lipids centrally, um, and there's, you know, it's uncomfortable. 
But medically, we worry more about giving these patients high cholesterol and uh, diabetes, pretty much. But of course, compared to where we were a couple of years prior, that's already a different set of problems. So there's currently one individual known to science who, when exposed to HIV, does not, the, the virus can't enter, and it has to do with the type of sticky proteins on the cell surface, and his particular kind um, are somehow not compatible with HIV. So they have, there's one patient who has been cured, um, but the only way this person was cured was by getting a bone marrow transplant from this one individual that had this unique mutation. So, so there's no way to scale that up, but for, so there's one patient. Currently, there's only one individual known who's completely resistant. All right, so um, sort of coming, coming now to, to the somewhat of a conclusion. So really, um, you know, compared to 10 years ago, we really have achieved that we can um, suppress uh, viral load in patients who are infected with HIV when the drugs are working well and the um, virus is not yet resistant. Um, the, the person will just have normal levels of T cells, will be able to mount his or her own immune response. Um, clearly then associated super infections are limited and uh, associated numbers of patients dying are reduced enormously. And also we've made great progress in drug formulation and understanding of the timing of drugs um, no longer having to get up at 2 a.m. to take six drugs and then get up at 4 a.m. to take four different drugs and get up at 7.30 to take 15 more. And if you forget one, it's a big no-no because now you've made your virus resistant. Um, the old, you can now have a single pill of um, heart therapy that has all those three drugs um, in the right amount, in the right concentration, you take a single pill and you're covered for the whole day. That makes it easier for the patient, but also less likely that he or she will forget just the one pill at 3.30 at night and boom, we have resistance. So huge progress, um, lots of good news, but there are still some challenges out there. So there still is resistance, so there's still a need to find new targets that we can fight the virus with, and I will show you two more targets. But as we can see, we're suppressing the viral activity, but we're not yet having a cure. So this is a challenge to all you high school students. Go forth and uh, get your Nobel Prize if you want uh, some tips on where the research needs to go, like HIV. Um, we need you, so do your best. Um, just to sort of show you what's, where we are heading already, um, as we saw, we have the uh, fake A's and T's and C's, and we have the protease inhibitors. There are patients who've been on these regimens for 20 some or 30 years, um, are resistant, and are in need of different targets. There is a drug called Maraviroc that will interfere with the ability of the virus to enter the cell. And of course, this is good because if the virus can't get in in the first place, we don't have integration, we don't have multiplication, et cetera. Um, currently, this is reserved for patients who are completely resistant to all the other drugs. And um, this is not just why, you know, the first drug we're currently um, picking off the shelf because we reserve it for the resistant uh, viruses. And secondly, again, very, very exciting. We have a drug that interferes with the ability of the virus to um, insert this uh, copied DNA into our host DNA. So if you get this drug early enough, you really prevent the virus from establishing itself in the host and sort of, to some extent, really prevent the infection from occurring. So this is really good news um, for the future and, and hopefully, eventually, uh, you guys are gonna build on this and give us a wonderful cure. So in conclusion for HIV, HIV really has 
um, become a chronic condition that we can manage with the array of drugs that we currently have. Um, however, um, those drugs are currently not curing the patient. So the patient will have to be on this regimen for um, the rest of his or her life. And so clearly we want to know how to cure these people. And um, I'll leave it at that. And then you guys have been very patient and active and learned a lot about all these classes of drugs. And I want to leave you with the bottom line. When we have drugs against microbes, we want to target the difference between us and them. And we discuss the concepts of drug resistance and all of our shared responsibility in preventing it from happening. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to entertain more questions. In the back. So the question was, hepatitis C is a virus that causes a lot of uh, human suffering too, and we have made a lot of uh, progress there as well. And um, some of the principles are similar to um, what we talked about in HIV. So some of the drugs are going after the ability of making DNA. And in fact, in the treatment, some of the drugs are going to be uh, the same as the drugs developed for HIV. And um, in addition, hepatitis C has a slightly different life cycle, and certain steps are inhibited by um, molecules that actually normally act in our immune system and sort of targeting those pathways that are unique to hep C. So we can talk more detail um, after, but the principles are the same. The question is recently there was an infant that was cured because many um, times when a mother is HIV positive um, and she gives birth, uh, the moment when there's a lot of exposure to um, bodily fluids is um, the high time of risk of infection. And this particular infant was treated with antiretroviral drugs immediately. So. The current understanding, um, or I, I will say my current understanding, is that um, the drugs worked before the virus could really establish a reservoir. So even though she was HIV positive, she wasn't, she wasn't really HIV positive. So the cure may, we might have gotten excited too soon, is how I currently understand it. Yes. The question, the condition where you have a protease pouch, so a real pouch and a buffalo hump in the back, is that reversible? Um, it depends a little bit on the timing and now that we um, know about it and if we see it happening, we might be able to switch. Um, but in some cases, there's now sort of an industry um, marketing plastic surgery, you know, at least just sort of um, cosmetically reversing it as opposed to... Um, waiting for it to go away because the truth is these patients can't afford to not have these drugs so if you um, try to reverse it you then still go on the drugs that are going to start it all over again so currently there are surgeries just to act cosmetically yes so when they prepare a flu shot how successful are they in the guess to target the virus of the many ones that are around? And I think over the past two years, we've been very successful, not we, not me, but they, um, because there will be uh, combinations. So in the flu vaccine, there will be a cocktail. And um, often you'll see the flu pandemic spreading um, across the world. So sometimes we look to other places of the world to predict what's coming. Um, and then the cocktail is, is containing several of the most suspected and the most infectious organisms. So last, some years it's very good, some years it's not that good. The question is, is this individual that's resistant to HIV also resistant to all other viruses? And I believe the answer is no, he's not resistant to all other viruses because each virus will use a particular subset of sort of sticky proteins on the cell surface to enter. It's not one size fits all because each the viruses are sort of competing with each other too. So could he, he could still, I think, get the flu, yeah. 
because the drugs that are now entry inhibitors for HIV are specifically um, targeting a certain glycoprotein, and it's not, and not even all HIV uses the same receptor. So there, there are subtypes of HIV who are not inhibited by one entry inhibitor, but are sensitive to another. So even within HIV, there are subspecialties. Okay. Thank you.